We often hear it's impossible to get a screenplay read, and especially now, so many new writers want to get into Netflix, want to get a meeting with someone. Is it impossible? No, it's not impossible. Um, but I think you have to calibrate. You have to be realistic. Um, I mean, people talk about Netflix a lot, certainly. It's the big lion in the jungle. Uh, and uh, we see a lot of good projects being produced or acquired. So that's great. Uh, Netflix is actually one of the companies, uh, being as big as they are, it's understandable. They're a company who basically advertises, they have a policy that we, if we don't have an existing relationship with you, don't knock on our door. Uh, so it would seem logical that people would have this feeling like, oh, I can't get read. But there's, but it's, but it's really not what it seems. What they're really saying is, invest a little time, make yourself known to us. How do you do that? Um, when the case of the first of all, there's 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 a couple of dozen very vibrant streamers, not just Netflix. They're not the world of streaming. They're one of the biggest of. And there's a lot of places that you can go who don't have, uh, you know, the policy of we don't accept unsolicited material or you can't come pitch us, whatever it might be. But if you really want to get in the door, it reminds me of, you know, back in the day when Carlos Santana wanted to play at Fillmore West up in San Francisco and Bill Graham, the empresario, was like, I don't know who this kid is. And he, you know, people, you knock and you knock and you knock. It's like Jeffrey Katzenberg from always used to say, if, if, you can, if you can't get in the front door, go through the back door. If you get in the back door, climb through a window. If you can't, go in through the basement. There's a way in. And that's true. Well, Carlos Santana climbed up a drain pipe on the exterior of the building to the third floor and fell through the window into Bill Graham's office. That's how they met. Well, I don't recommend that necessarily, but it worked. It started his career. By the same token, if you want to get into Netflix, how hard is it to research who are all the people who've either produced for them an original or had a film acquired by them and cozy up to them? This is a team sport. This is, it takes a village to get any project made, series, feature, limited series, docu-series, whatever. So you're gonna wanna be knowing these people regardless. Well, why don't you just find the ones who are doing the kinds of projects, genre, budget, that are similar to yours, who happen to have that relationship and go that route. Um, there's a lot of ways in, um, but there's the other, and, and the other way is there are a lot of people who work at Netflix. Befriend them. It's not all, this is not a, like a pass fail report card or menu of options. It's a human reality. If you really are determined to get into Netflix, there are people at all levels from, from assistant all the way up uh, where you can identify them and you can find them on LinkedIn. They're, they're named and you can reach out to them and you can do what we were just talking about a moment ago, which is introduce yourself, but not to say, I want a pitch meeting or I want you to read my script. I just want to get to know you. Because what happens is if you actually invest a couple of short calls doing that over a period of weeks, that prohibition against we don't deal with strangers or we don't read unsolicited material vanishes, it evaporates because now you're not unknown. That's a human metric. And you can overcome that. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll share a quick story about many, many years ago. Um, I always, when I have a project, I always put together what I call a top 100 list. Who are the people that ideally, in every category, that I want to, that I would want to approach to talk about this project? From editors and writers and cinematographers and casting directors to producers to buyers, studios, streamers, you name it. And I will just go through that list and prioritize them and I'll reach out to them. And usually again, it may not be the name on the door or maybe it is. Um, but the idea, um, the story that I wanna share is that years ago I, I, I made a list and um, it wasn't arrogance, it was just, I'm, it was a dream. So I added a name to my list that was the most preeminent name in Hollywood at the time and probably still is, Steven Spielberg. So here I am, a little guppy, and I put the name of Steven Spielberg on my list. 
And I think, you know, you know, normally you would think, oh, sober up child, it's not going to happen. But as it turns out, I had gotten to know uh, this wonderful guy, young guy named Mitch, who was an entry level guy. I met him when he was an assistant. He got promoted to creative executive and he was now a creative executive at Amblin. His ultimate boss was Steven. And um, so I spent some months just nurturing that relationship. And one day, uh, someone sent me a script and it was absolutely gorgeous. It was beautifully crafted, a story, young characters, kind of a very special care, very emotional, young, uh, uh, young leads. Uh, but it was just tremendously well done. So I called up this fellow whose name was Mitch. And I said, Mitch, I read this script. We'd been co-conspirators. We're both starting out in the business. We were friends now, new friendship, and we were excited. So he read it and he called me back. He read it on the weekend, the usual Monday morning call back. And he, he called me back and he said, uh, he praised it. He said, this is absolutely gorgeous. It was very emotional. It took me back to when I was that age. I had a not dissimilar experience. Fa fabulous, thank you. It was really, really interesting. It's gonna be a pass. And I said, okay, Mitch, um, I, one favor, why? Why is this a pass? You just, you were just singing its praises. And he said, because it's too small for Stephen. I said, okay, that's fair. I understand that. But let me ask you a question. If you put this script in Stephen's briefcase for his weekend read, and he were to come back Monday and say to you, this is a pass, would you have any, and specifically whether it's because it's too small or otherwise, would you have any cause for embarrassment? Would it in any way jeopardize your standing in the company? He said, no, it's a brilliant script. I said, great, then I am on, we're on a phone, you can't see me, but I'm on one knee and I am begging you, put it in Stephen's briefcase. And he did. Stephen read it and he wanted to buy it. Now, the, no one was more stunned than I was. But I think this is a business that turns on belief. It's a business that turns on passion. It's a business that you just got to go with your instincts and get your head out of the game sometimes because this is the fear factor, right? This is the don't take risk factor. Speak the truth and make friends with people. If I can get Steven Spielberg to want to buy a script, I mean, he didn't know, Gary Goldstein's the name, I might as well have been the clerk at the local convenience store. Right? If an agent, by the way, had sent that very same script on my behalf, it would have been absolutely a pass. It would never have gotten to Stephen. Because it wasn't about report, it wasn't about an exploration. It was like, okay, it's a pass, I get it. Um, magic happens when you make yourself available, when you make yourself known, when you care enough to ask the right questions, speak your truth. The fact that I, as a young guppy in the business, could get the attention of Steven Spielberg and maybe actually have a project together was unthinkable. People would have said, you're nuts. Um, so do I think that it's hard to get your script read? I think it's hard to get your script read when you don't take risk. If you're relying on the wrong mindset, the wrong strategy, a blind query letter, or relying on some third party. We all of us need, we deserve to get in the game. We deserve to have relationships, to have cohorts and collaborators and champions and fans and allies and um, help one another mutually. At what point is too much, though? I think one, many people in the entertainment industry, they're long on enthusiasm, but sometimes, certain times it can be too much. Maybe they got to sort of reel it back in because you don't want to hurt your reputation where, oh, it's that person again. That happens often. Um, and and it, it may be um, a, a very well-intended enthusiasm. Sure. But... The enthusiasm I think you're referring to is a very self-facing enthusiasm, okay? So it's, it's, 
it's it's maybe not intended to be overly grand or braggadocio or any of that, but it may come across that way, uh, or just too self-focused. Period. Right. So, what I would share with people is is that idea that vulnerability and honesty and truth is not a push energy. It's a pull energy. It's a very attractive energy. But don't spend the whole time talking about yourself. In fact, uh, one of the great life lessons in not just Hollywood, but in life is fewer words, listen more. The less you say, the fewer words you use to communicate, the more the other person remembers. If you talk too much, it just becomes a, a blur. Um, but be other focused, care about the other person, be curious. I think that curiosity and gratitude and all, you know, they're bywords today, but they're real. Those are real energies. And if I approach you and I'm grateful for, you know, thank you so much for taking this call, not over being overly solicitous, but just honest. Um, and asking about, you know, how, you know, how long have you been there and how did you get that job? It's awesome. And where, where do you aspire to go? I would probably be the only person, not only that day, but that week, month, and possibly longer, who's actually shown a genuine curiosity or interest in you, because everyone else is in a rush to get past you to the boss. Um, it's easy to make friends in this business, actually. Um, but you're right. You can't assault people with enthusiasm and expect it to be an effective strategy. It has to be very moderated. Less is more. Quiet is better than loud. Truth is better than grandiosity. Um, so it's just being measured uh, because it's, 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 it's hard. You know, the g-force of people's enthusiasm can be um, unwelcome. If you were starting from zero, today, how long do you think it would take you to get into a place like Netflix to pitch ideas? It's a great question. I, I think it takes, I think it takes a while. It, it's going to take a while regardless. You have to be committed and you have to be willing to invest some time. Um, in the olden days, we networked in a different way. We showed up in person for coffee, breakfast, lunch, dinner, office meetings, nonstop. The advantage of, I mean, the, the downside to that was it was extraordinarily time consuming. The upside of that was it was very personal. The advantage of today is we can reach anyone we want. I can Google anybody, find out how to get in touch with them, where they are, where they work. If I don't know someone at that agency or that streamer, I can find out who works there. Um, I can reach out to them very quickly, digitally. I can speak to them on a phone. I can get them on a Zoom. I can do whatever, you know, those are those options are very available to us. So we can truncate the time, but we need more frequency of interaction because of the lack of personal connection. If we're not sitting across a lunch table from them, it's different. Uh, but again, I, th I really think that's incumbent on us to be so conscious and present and, and aware of what our mission is and how we want to get there. I think the problem today is we are separated by um, technology or we're connected by technology, but we're not physically in the room with them more often than not. People say, do I need to be in LA? No, you don't need to be in LA. If you're in LA, you'd be having the same number of meetings that you're having right now initially for the foreseeable. So technology is our friend, but it's not as personal. The hardest part back then was finding someone and getting together physically with them so you could have a relationship with them. Today, you can find, identify someone quickly in an instant online and you can reach out to them instantly by email, by phone, what have you. Uh, but you have to invest in that and make it personal. You have to come across in a different way. If, you're, if, the, if the intention is, I just want a pitch meeting, that's gonna be hard especially at a place like Netflix. Until you build your those bridges, those rapport-based bridges that let you walk into that opportunity. So I think it's really less about how is it the same or how is it different than are we, are we ready, willing, and able 
to invest ourselves in bridge building, human bridge building, or are we just looking for someone to set us up for a meeting? One is realistic, one is not.